Okay, hello folks. I am Joshua Gonzalez. I am Abundant Housing LA's Education Director. And today we are here with the third session of our Below Market Rate Blueprint Affordable Housing course. Tonight we are uh, talking about implementing accessory dwelling units or ADUs for affordable housing. Our instructors tonight are Andrew Slocum and Matthew Glesney. Andrew was born and raised in the modest village of Joshua Tree, experienced firsthand the housing challenges that beset small, low-income communities. And with that and a family deeply entrenched in politics, both at the federal and local levels, his early exposure to public service and policymaking ignited a lifelong passion for housing policy and development. Motivated to affect positive change in the lives of individuals and communities, he embarked on a career dedicated to crafting sustainable and affordable housing solutions. Matt is a senior city planner for the Los Angeles Department of City Planning. In the position, he co-leads the department's housing policy unit, which is responsible for developing various citywide housing-related initiatives and coordinating the implementation of state legislation. He recently completed the city's update to the housing element and has led the development of many housing policies, such as the Transit Oriented Communities, or TOC, Affordable Housing Incentive Program, the City's Accessory Dwelling Unit, or ADU, policy, the Home Sharing Ordinance, the Affordable Housing uh, Linkage Fee, and Permanent Supportive Housing Ordinance. So we have folks with a lot of experience tonight. Andrew and Matt, if you'd like to take it from here, you are welcome to. Is this me, Andrew? Are you... <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is the, as uh, Josh said, this is the third class, and the, uh, and this is our accessory dwelling units. Um, we're basing this off of the uh, state legislation that has uh, been imposed for 2023. Um, it, it changes every year, um, and January 1st of next year, there'll be some new legislation that we're going to talk about in this as well. So we should be good uh, from 2023 till 2024 with what we're going to be speaking about here. Um, and I'm going to give it over to Matt to go from here at the beginning of our class. Thank you. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, Matt Glesney here with the Los Angeles City Planning. I'll be kind of doing the first part, just sort of an overview and then uh, pass it back to Andrew uh, to get into the, uh, some of the more a practitioner on the ground um, related materials. So just starting with the basics, uh, what is an ADU? Um, and I imagine most folks have some semblance of, of what it is, but just to kind of walk through the main components of the definition, this is kind of a hodgepodge of the state definition kind of simplified a little bit, but it's just some important parts are that it's self-contained. It's, it's usually, you know, its own entrance and exit separate from uh, a primary residence. Um, it's, it's a real home. It can be attached or detached um, from that main home. It is considered accessory to the main home, which does make it a little bit different um, from sort of a legal point of view compared to just a straight duplex um, as it is considered accessory to the main home. Um, it has to share the same lot as a primary residential dwelling. Um, you actually can't have an ADU unless there's a primary dwelling or a main other unit um, on the lot. That's a requirement. And then, yeah, it, it's a full-fledged dwelling unit, which means it has a place, you know, a living area, sleeping area, kitchen, and a bathroom to do uh, all your daily necessities. Um, but we'll, there, there's many different types. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of be getting into, into some of that later. Next slide. All right. So um, the little, little bit about just you know policy intent and the, the background of, of ADUs, and, and they've certainly become uh, very important in the state of California and nationwide as part of the housing solution. And uh, but we wanted to point out that you know these aren't really new. Um, forms of housing, that these are, you know, a second unit on a lot, an accessory backyard unit. They used to be called granny flats, right? They, they've actually, you know, a long history 
uh, probably as long as there's been homes, there's been um, this idea of a, of a back home um, that can be used as a rental unit, um, you know, until sort of uh, zoning laws probably came in and, and, and made, you know, established single family zoning only and sort of for a long time made second units um, and many units um, illegal, but they're back. Um, and I think that's because of obviously the housing crisis and the need for, for additional forms of housing. Um, they have a lot of though, you know, I think a lot of benefits. Um, first of all, in, in, in terms of affordability, which is uh, a central theme of what we'll be talking about tonight is um, while they're not, you know, they're not capital A deed restricted affordable, um, like some other forms of housing, they are more often more naturally affordable, right? Or certainly one of the more affordable and attainable housing options in the neighborhoods that they exist in, which is usually in, you know, single family homes where you'd have to, you know, put down a big down payment and, um, and are much usually larger. These are usually, ADs are usually smaller, more naturally affordable just for that reason and provide, you know, rental options at a more attainable price point than would be otherwise available in that neighborhood. So these are often in, you know, neighborhoods that would be quite exclusive, very difficult to, to buy into, neighborhoods with good schools, uh, close to jobs. These are often, um, you know, one of the more affordable housing types. And in fact, we've done some research and, and that really, that really bears, bears out. Um, and we'll be showing you, there's some, some surveys on affordability has been done and we'll be showing you those statistics to prove it. Um, they also really importantly, um, they, they, they help home ownership. They, they are, they're a way to get into the ladder of home ownership, um, by having that second rental income that can help pay your mortgage. So I personally only became a property owner in the city of Los Angeles because I was able to buy a duplex and have that rental income that allowed me to afford a mortgage that I probably otherwise couldn't afford. Um, that allowed me to to get into the, the housing appreciation game and and um, and really really was critical um, to that. So that's it's a really I think it's an important way that that folks can can either you know buy into uh, property that they wouldn't otherwise and maintain that uh, maintain that home and, and you know maybe if you lose a job um, if you are retired right you, this this rental income can really be critical to to keeping your home stable and making sure your payments are made on time and all, all that good stuff. So it's important for the the owner and and the renter. Um, they, they really serve some unique and diverse housing needs, um, just because of their, their unique nature, right? Like we see a lot of multi-generational families, um, with, you know, one part of the family living in the main home and maybe the, the parents or maybe the children or, um, uh, other family members who, who need housing. Uh, it, it really is a great fit for sort of, uh, this idea of keeping the family close and, um, and, and providing housing options that often are, are too expensive, uh, as we know, in, in our state and our region. Um, they're great for thinking about downsizing, right? As, we, as our population is aging, um, you may not need that big house anymore um, after the kids move out and you could move into your ADU and you could rent out the, the main home. So it's, it's sort of a great um, you know, way to, to stay in your neighborhood, stay on your property without having to, to leave your community uh, to have those options right in town. So it, it sort of um, it sort of creates um, you know kind of a nice ecosystem for for, for serving different needs. I, I've seen a lot of like um, like nerd like you know people that may need home nursing, and, or you know uh, 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 people to watch the kids like all right all kinds of like uh, there might be all kinds of uses for having a backyard home that. Um, that, that really are facilitated by ADUs that would otherwise be impossible. So they do that. And then they, they have great environmental benefits as well by often you know, being attached to the main home, they use less energy, um, they promote density and walkability, um, access to jobs, less driving, again, being able to live where you wanna live, even if you might not be able to afford that down payment on a million dollar home. Um, so that, that creates environmental benefits as well. Um, next slide, please. All right, so we wanted to um, tell, tell the brief story of, of California ADU history. It, it is kind of interesting um, uh, for, for housing nerds at least. Um, it's a story of the state, probably one of the first areas where the state got involved in housing back in 1982, creating what they call the second dwelling unit law. But 
it was very toothless, right? It was like, we like ADUs, we encourage cities to, to facilitate ADUs, um, but it kind of left it at that and let cities really take the lead on developing these ordinances. It sort of legalized the ability to have ADUs, but um, left it to cities to really craft the regulations. Uh, well, as some folks on this call probably know, that didn't, that didn't go very well, right? Like cities, cities maybe created ordinances, but had lots of um, development standards or regulations, requirements that made it really infeasible to build ADUs. And so, um, including discretionary reviews, the city of LA, for example, and like, I think we responded to this in 1985 and we said, you need a conditional use permit to do a, a, an ADU. That's how it was uh, for, for 15, 20 years. You needed, you know, to go, to go through a kind of a six, nine month entitlement process um, to get an ADU. And so that was fun. That was the first thing the state stripped out in 2002. They said, okay, no, you need to have it be a by right ministerial process. You can't have a discretionary review process. It needs to be quicker and easier. And that's, that process is called ministerial, um, but still allowed cities to come up with the standards. Um, we did that like many other cities, but we still had so many standards and requirements that, um, really, again, prohibited and, and made ADUs very difficult, especially on kind of your average size lots. Maybe they worked on big giant lots where you had lots of room for the parking and all the requirements uh, that were necessary, the setbacks and all the rest, uh, but they didn't work very well on most, most, most lots in California, um, in Los Angeles. So uh, the big change came in 2016 uh, with a package of a couple bills um, that really just changed the game in 2016 and, and, and starting in 2017 when they became effective. Um, and I'll walk through what that law did, but it basically said, um, no cities, you really need to allow ADUs. Here's the minimum state requirements. And you, you, there's some certain standards that we are just gonna establish statewide that local cities have to abide by and, and sort of takes that local control from the, the city's ability in some really key ways. And, and, and did some other things that really opened up the floodgates for ADUs. And then we've you know, seen continued refinements um, since then every year, um, as Andrew was alluding to, they keep coming, keeps getting uh, refined and more and more, really removing more and more barriers as I see every year um, to, to, to facilitate more types of ADUs. Um, next slide. So you can see the result of, of state law changing here. You see, uh, this is city of Los Angeles, ADU permits. Um, we were getting next to none, maybe a few dozen, maybe, maybe 100, 150 per year before the big changes in 2017. And then as soon as that state law changed, um, we saw a huge spike immediately. Um, you can see getting the 2,000, 4,000, we've been at 5,000. And then last year, banner year, kind of a culmination of, I think, you know, I think a lot of different things, um, 7,000 ADU permits in the city of LA. That's like 30% of all housing permitted in the city of Los Angeles. I think I heard the numbers like 20% statewide or something like that, like 18, 20% statewide. Um, so certainly um, becoming an important part of, of new housing in, in the state and the city um, since these state law changes. So it really shows the power uh, of, of state law and, and how local control was really holding this back uh, until the state got more involved. Um, next slide, please. All right, so um, not to get too deep, but the, the basic sort of three types of ADUs are your detached ADU, which um, obviously is detached, separate, separate walls from the main primary dwelling. This is you know often the thing in the backyard, um, probably what most folks typically think about an ADU. Um, but the other, the other uh, two types are actually, uh, I think like more popular. Um, attached ADUs is just like it sounds, attached to the main home, an addition or carving out um, a piece of the home with, and, and adding an addition. Um, anything that's added or attached to the main home, um, that's an attached ADU. And then conversions are, have sort of a special uh, set of rules that are probably the, the, the easiest to establish any existing space, whether it's in your existing garage or your existing home or your existing accessory structure can very easily be converted uh, without really needing to worry about any zoning at all. 
Um, and so from a regulatory point of view, it's, it's, it's the easiest. I think it's often the cheapest, although sometimes, you know, converting garages have challenges. Maybe Andrew will be able to talk a little bit about that. But um, this is actually the most common we see in LA. About half of our ADUs are considered conversions of existing space. Um, so those are the three main types. And then this fourth type, um, junior ADUs um, or JADUs. And this is kind of its unique category, um, has its own rules. Um, these are allowed often in addition to an ADU. So now we'll explain this. You can get usually generally one of these types of ADUs in addition to a JADU, so three units. But the junior ADU is, is capped um, at 500 square feet. So it really is junior. Um, it has a special allowance to actually allow you to share a bathroom with the main home. So it is, it's, it's kind of the exception from the self-contained that it can actually have a, an entryway into the main residence and you can sort of share, share anything, I suppose, but share a bathroom. In other words, the, the JADU doesn't have to have its own bathroom. It can, it can share, uh, which is unusual. Um, it, it can be uh, existing living space. It can be, it can be existing garage space. Um, it does need to be attached to the primary residence. So a JADU cannot be detached. Um, it cannot be uh, separated. It does need to be attached. It can be, it can be built out, but it does need to be attached at the end of the day. Um, so that's important. And then JADUs just never need parking. Um, so that, that's, that's also a, a unique rule. Um, there's a few other unique rules, in, including that you need to have an owner occupancy actually right their owner occupancy is still required for this typology uh, the main home would have to be owner occupied you have to, have to sign a covenant um, to stay that way while you're having a jade you i believe uh, so that's something that is is and we'll be talking about that's now been stripped from the regular adu law but still remains in the jadu law uh, next slide All right, so this is this is the, the wonkiest slide. I um, won't, won't spend too much time, but I think the main idea here is that there's sort of two main types um, that we think about um, in terms of what requirements can apply. Um, there's sort of what we call the local ADUs, which is where cities can actually develop their own standards um, with some minimum state standards guaranteed. So there's some limits to that. And that, some examples of this is, uh, uh, the size limits, these cannot be larger than 1,200 square feet for a detached or more than 50% of the main home's floor area if it's attached. Um, but like parking is an example where the state has said, here's sort of the state parking requirements for these, for all types of ADUs, um, including these types. So basically parking is waived. Um, cities cannot enforce parking requirements if the ADU is within a half mile of any public transit. Um, not, not a specified, you know, uh, transit, you know, certain service levels. It gets very complicated in some other definitions in state law. This is, this is really any, any bus uh, that has a bus stop um, would, would, get, would, would remove any parking requirements that a city can enforce if you're within a half mile. Um, same with setbacks. This is obviously really important. So these are sort of the critical things that the state has sort of, you know, guaranteed. Uh, cities cannot require more than four feet uh, rear and side setbacks from your property line. Um, this is a really big deal. So this is an example again of, of the state setting the ground rules. Um, there's a few more of these. One is one, you know, important to LA, and this is this was. Um, the backstory is that the, a planner from LA actually knew that LA had this weird thing called the passageway requirement, which requires like a 10 foot clear to the sky passage from the sidewalk to any door on the property. And so like a lot of old homes didn't have 10 feet. They have maybe nine feet. Um, Pre-war homes um, had a driveway with eight feet. Um, so literally they were impossible to build uh, with that passageway requirement. So that uh, made it into the state law as something that cities cannot enforce, cities cannot enforce that passageway. So there it goes. So um, I think the state really tried to get rid of the most common barriers, um, but did leave some room for cities to create local objective standards. That's very important. Um, cities cannot have any subjective or uh, anything that would require any discretion or anything that would require um, any sort of things like compatibility, or like, you know, like it has to, uh, like a lot, of, a lot of design standards are, are, are considered more subjective. That's basically objective is like something that you can measure. 
uh, something that everyone sitting around a table can read it and know what it means and know exactly what it what it would re result in. Whereas subjective things are those things that say, you know, be compatible with the the architecture of the home. That's a very subjective thing where you don't quite know is this design compatible or not. Um, those are not allowed to be enforced on ADUs. Only objective standards. So, and then. There's this sort of, you know, belt and suspenders requirement that says any any standards that cities do create cannot uh, unreasonably restrict um, ADUs, and so that that's sort of that's a bit wishy washy, and I think some cities probably go right up to the line on that um, with their with their some of their policies. Um, there is a process where the state actually has to review local ADU ordinances. And I think that's what they're looking at. The state would then write you a letter back and say, uh, this is the state housing and community development or HCD. Um, cities are supposed to send them and give some time for them to comment. And, and they can certainly then write you a letter back and say, we think these standards um, may restrict um, ADUs and we urge you to reconsider them. Um, and so there, that process is sort of built into the law uh, to, try to, to try to nip that in the bud. But then um, this sort of, catch-all at the second pathway, I think is really, really the pow most powerful part of state law. And that is what we call state law ADUs. So these are sort of a different category of several types of ADUs. It's in subsection E for, for those uh, paying, paying attention, um, that basically says for these certain types of state law ADUs that meet some certain state guidance, they actually can exceed all your local requirements, or they actually don't need to uh, uh, they don't need to comply with the development standards that you normally would be applied to your local ADUs in the first category. Um, you actually cannot apply any of those local standards if they meet the criteria of a state ADU. And so the examples of the state ADUs are conversions of existing space, as I mentioned. No zoning could be applied if you're just converting existing space, whether it's in your main home or accessory dwelling unit. Um, same thing for a detached ADU up to 800 square feet. Um, with some confusing height limits. It got a little confusing last year. There's could be 16 feet, 18 feet if you have transit, 20 feet if you've got a flat roof um, and transit, I think. Um, but basically in four foot setbacks and, and basically if you meet that, again, you're not supposed to be able to, to apply your local, any local additional standards if it meets those basic state standards. And then um, in the last couple of years, they've added these multifamily ADUs. So, so on lots with, with multifamily buildings, like a duplex or a huge apartment building or anything in between, everybody gets two detached ADUs um, in the back and or the conversion of any non-habitable space within that apartment building or duplex, like say you've got a parking garage uh, underneath your apartment, or you've got a big old manager's office space, or you've got a rec room, or you've got a You've got a laundry room or some anything that's sort of a non-habitable space can be converted to ADUs within that multifamily building up to 25% of the number of units. So if you've got a 100 unit building and we're seeing this all over the place in LA, people are taking a 100 unit building and chopping up some of the parking and can create 25 ADUs in that old parking space without having to worry about replacing the parking or providing new parking or uh, much of anything else. Those are state uh, state permissible without, again, getting into zoning, without getting into like open space requirements that would often kick in and often other things like that. They're just not applied. So these are very powerful ADUs. We call them the state exemption ADUs. Um, and then just like the final really important part of this law that changed in 2017 was again, like basically very clearly saying that any local ordinance that doesn't comply with all of this is null and void. So like it literally just said like, no ambiguity, like if you're, and, and I'm sure nobody's did comply. So everybody had to throw away their, their ADU ordinances and either just adopt the state law or adopt a new ordinance that's compliant with the new state law. Um, so very, this is, this is a very powerful law, it really took away a lot of uh, uh, ability for local cities to, to prohibit ADUs. And essentially the upshot is that like, ADUs are pretty much allowed in most residential properties in the state of California, unless there's something really kind of wild and crazy going on. But these, these laws are sort of strong enough to I think to comfortably kind of say that, that um, it'd be very difficult to, to deny them. Um, next slide. All right, just um, 
just want to get into like quickly like uh, some combinations. It gets very complicated, but again, just like what are you allowed to do on your typical lot? Well, generally, again, like I said, you you get one ADU whether it's attached or detached, and a junior ADU. So you get basically two ADUs plus your main home. You get um, you could have three three units on any lot, any single family lot um, in California um, is the base version. And then it goes up from there. Um, the state has put out some, some, some guidance recently. Um, they have this memo, they're, they're, or sorry, a handbook, an HCD ADU handbook. And they've clarified, um, there's always some ambiguities. And it's very helpful when they clarify. They clarified that those state law ADUs that I just mentioned, those particular types of state law ADUs, um, can be combined with each other and combined. So that can actually get you to have one attached ADU, one detached ADU, uh, plus your single family home, plus a JADU. So now you're talking about three ADUs or four units in total on a lot if you structure it that way. And then kind of the maximum version um, is, is to say if you have a multifamily dwelling um, on on a lot, like say you've got an SB9 duplex, as probably many of you know about Senate Bill 9 from a couple of years ago, allows duplexes on all uh, single family properties. Well, that can be combined as shown in the drawing here. You can create your little SB9 duplex. Now you've got a multifamily property. Once you have a multifamily property, you'll, you'll remember you can get two detached ADUs. Um, and then you can get an additional attached on top of that. Um, the state attached, as I mentioned, and now you're looking at five units um, on a property. Uh, so duplex and two, eight, two, two detached um, plus one attached will get you to five. So, um, and I, you know, I think like, I don't know that everyone realizes this. I don't even know the city of LA realizes this. So um, these, these, these interpretations are really important and, and making sure that cities are, are following what the state is putting out there is really important to really make sure you know all of what's possible. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, the, some just some other provisions I talked about having to submit your ordinance to the state. Um, ADU is really important, have to be approved in 60 days. And, and basically the language is if you don't give a clear reason why they should not be approved, like there's something wrong with the plans, then they sh they like they're considered approved by that silence. Like if you don't say if something's wrong with it, then it actually says shall be deemed. Uh, to be approved, which is pretty strong language. Um, you know, so this is really the state saying this should be quick, this should be easy, and there's actually penalties if cities don't sort of act and, and review your plans quickly. Um, some uh, impact fees, the state has some regulations about impact fees that are really important. Obviously, impact fees can be a housing killer. Um, and so they've, they've said no impact fees for smaller radius, less than 750 square feet, and all other fees are really supposed to be proportional. Um, to the size of the home. You can't charge an ADU like the same fee that would be for a, you know, a house that's twice the size. So uh, there should be some proportionality. Um, schools, I think, still get to, to charge their fees, right? I think that was clarified. School districts get to charge their fees. They're, they're, they're outside of this world. After 500 square feet, they can't, they kick in. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so not totally fee free. Um, some, some interesting language about like non-conforming zoning. And again, the, the, this, is, this has to do with probably a lot of properties have things that like once were legal, but are now illegal or were never legalized or were unpermitted. These unpermitted or non-conforming things that may exist on a property cannot be used as a basis to deny an ADU uh, unless there's like a health and safety issue. So uh, this is really important. And, and uh, this, this is actually, you know, we had in city of LA, we were requiring people with an unpermitted garage to um, that wanted to just legalize it. Uh, it had been used as an ADU already, but it was never permitted. We were actually making them go convert it to a garage first before that they can then convert it later to an ADU through a two-step process, made no sense. Um, this helped us understand that that is not permitted and you can't, it, it, just the fact that it was illegally permitted doesn't mean you have to get it sort of like up to legal, you know, you know, conforming first before you can convert it to an ADU, that that can all happen at once. Um, so this is, this is really important. Um, and then parking, um, and, and this is really important, like replacement of covered parking. So if you need to 
you know, this is how a lot of ADUs happen, right? Like you've got some, you've got some parking garage in the back. That's the logical place to put an ADU, but you need to remove your parking because there's not enough space. Well, the state law says um, removing that, removing that covered parking to build an ADU um, will never require you to replace it. So that's really helped um, make sure that that parking is not a, a limitation on, on building ADUs. Um, quickly, I wanted to also, Andrew promised we're gonna hit the 2023. This is the new stuff that, that governor just signed. Um, these are hot off the press. These will go into effect in January. Um, and just really quickly, they, they allow, really exciting, they allow a, a ADU to be sold kind of like a condo. Um, up till today, ADUs typically can only be rented, could not be sold. Uh, there was a small carve out for like low income housing, like Habitat for Humanity. Uh, they were able to sell um, and still can, but this actually allows cities to open up uh, for sale ADUs through a local ordinance. This is not automatic. Cities have to opt into this, but it is now a legal thing that cities can do to allow um, the sale of an ADU, which ideally should be cheaper, right, than, than the, the homes around it, uh, a more affordable home ownership option. Um, and then something really important, I think, for like lenders and, and, and you know, builders is like, there's always been the specter of owner occupancy um, that you have, like a lot of cities had owner occupancy rules before the state law said this. They said, you can do an ADU, but you have to live on the property. Um, that was suspended in the original state laws, like until 2026 or something. Like you said, you can't have it, no, no owner occupancy rules for like five years or something. Now they've said there will never be owner occupancy rules. Um, cities can never snap back. So like that, that looming time, you know, uh, it, it, you know, ticking clock is now gone. I've heard that's important for lenders, right? Who don't, who are nervous about owner occupancy requirements and things like that. So that might help loosen up some, some lending and funding, I understand. Um, another interesting one is that's a bill from um, someone, member Carrillo saying that cities must have a pre-approved ADU. And I think Andrew's gonna talk a little bit more about pre-approved ADUs, which is, a, which is a tool some cities have used to try to speed up the process and make it more affordable. Um, this is saying cities have to have one. And a little, not little note under there that's really interesting that I'm still trying to digest, but it basically says that like once you've approved a type of ADU, um, a plan, that plan almost automatically becomes a pre-approved ADU. It's like, it, it basically becomes something you can replicate. If, you've, if you're a builder, you're an architect, this is my ADU plan and I'm gonna build it over here. The idea is once you've built it and it's been approved in one scenario, it sort of automatically becomes a pre-approved plan on another piece of property too. And they should just be looking at, you know, the unique things about that lot, like, you know, the, the, the placement on the lot, but they shouldn't be sort of plan checking plans that they've already conceivably said were okay. Um, we've heard sometimes you get, you get submit the same plans and you get different corrections back from, from building departments. This I think is also helping to avoid that scenario where, hey, you approved this over here, it was fine. Here it's not. I think this is trying to address that as well. Um, and then just some wonky sort of increasement of state enforcement, clarifying some language that the state HCD agency has jurisdiction to enforce against bad actor cities um, that are maybe not following the ADU law. So I think it's just some language clarifying that the HCD has that role to enforce this particular statute. Um, they have that particular role in a number of other statutes. And I think this is clarifying that they have it here as well. So um, exciting stuff. I think, I think I'm passing it on now. Am I, yeah, um, yeah, that's you know? right. Before yeah. we go though, I wanna just clarify. Um, the 60 day time round, it must be approved or denied within the 60 days and um, doing hundreds of these, I've never had one approved the first round. There's always something that needs to be corrected. So to think you're gonna get uh, an approval in the first 60 days, even doing this for um, homes owned by the city that's reviewing them, even their own properties, they won't you know, approve the first round. There's always something that needs to some level of correction. So. Um, the way where you submit your plans and then you'll have those corrections that you need to correct within 60 days. So then that clock stops while it's your turn to correct those. Then you resubmit the plans and that 60 day timer starts again. And it's almost always much quicker the second time around because the plan checkers familiarize themselves with it. Maybe it is a minor change, 
So I've had, you know, that second round be one week or, or two weeks, something very quick because it's very minor. But uh, just to think you're going to submit some hand drawings um, without, you know, the, the full set of pages and it's going to be approved in 60 days, it's very unlikely. And also I've, I've had some that have gone after 60 days um, and uh, still um, no one wanted to adhere to this. Um, so how you actually enforce that is, is very difficult, but it, it's written in there, just hard to know how to actually enforce that it's deemed automatically approved. Like, do you just go and try to pay for your building permit? Um, it wasn't necessarily that simple. So we just agreed that they would do the review in one week since they had forgot about it. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. very, very uh, interesting on that 60 days, but it helps immensely because other projects could have just not been reviewed ever or within a year or three years. So that made a massive difference. Um, and here we're gonna talk about how ADUs work almost anywhere. Um, because they are an accessory use, we need to have some kind of primary use, right? We cannot have an accessory dwelling unit on an only commercial building or an only office building because it doesn't have any primary residential use. So if you have a single family home um, or a multifamily building, which multifamily is uh, two units at the minimum attached to each other, um, you can have any of those combinations of accessory dwelling units that we talked about. Um, so extra space in the backyard for your detached ADU. Um, do you have an attached garage for either a junior ADU if it's 500 square feet or an attached ADU or an extra master bedroom or a bedroom that you can turn into the junior ADU? So almost any residential use in California now has the ability to have an ADU. You know, people ask me, can I do an ADU here? Uh, do you want to look at it? No. Is it a residential use? Yes, you can do an ADU there. Um, almost, almost every time there's a residential use, the answer is yes, you can do an ADU and you just have to check the box on which ADU it is that works for your property. Um, one of the more uh, important things that have changed, especially in the interest rate environment that we're in right now is how do I, how do I finance an ADU? Um, at one point, uh, as ADUs became more popular, they were not uh, known like through the uh, federal government on how they would be financed by say HUD lenders or Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. They weren't necessarily con considered a, a, a regular unit. So you would get a much lower value um, placed on the ADU. Therefore financing it was that much harder because the cost of it is pretty much fixed at what it's gonna cost. But then the value of it, is it gonna be considered valued as say a duplex would be even though it may be the exact same thing as a duplex, but in name, it's an accessory dwelling unit. So the different types of financing today, now that it's more recognized, um, most people will either have cash um, or use personal loans or short-term loans, such as a construction loan. But many homeowners um, are pulling from the equity that they have uh, using a home equity line of credit because most people have a, a lower interest rate on their main property, they aren't looking to refinance from their two to three or their all time low interest rates to maybe a six and a half or a 7% interest rate um, for their whole property. So instead that home equity that they have, they extract that and pay for uh, the ADU using that. Um, there's also uh, renovation financing that the federal government and the state has um, from Freddie Mac, um, FHA. Um, there's also private financing from banks and credit unions um, and then the state housing finance agencies that have realized that especially in California now uh, throughout the United States as ADUs become more popular um, programs specifically for construction of ADUs. Um, now everyone has every financing instrument has its own scope of uh, what ADU can be allowed and how they do that and which drawbacks. So you have to work with a lender that someone knows about accessory dwelling units so that they can figure out what's the best product from you. You know, 62% um, use their personal savings while 43% of ADU uh, single family have used a mortgage or from their home equity. Most of the time, uh, multifamily, um, it's, it's a construction loan or a hard money loan uh, when you, buy the property in order to add those additional units and then a takeout refinance afterwards. So like say I'm buying a duplex, I'm gonna add two units. I will get uh, the acquisition money and then the hard money 
loan that will allow me to build the two units. And then afterwards, I'll just get a conventional loan now for the four units um, in order to, to pay for everything. And it almost always works out because the biggest cost was that land. Once you have the land, then you can add the two units just at the cost of the construction without paying our, our California land prices. Um, here we're gonna talk about timeline, which really goes back to that 60 day period um, that we talked about. Um, you know, a lot of people think um, ADUs are, are, should be extremely easy. And, and in a way they are by the development standards, but it is still the same construction as it would be a house maybe smaller in nature, but the whole process of what you're building for an ADU is the same as a home. If it's a 1200 square foot home and a 1200 square foot ADU, the construction process is gonna be exactly the same, except for the review period for the ADU is gonna be much quicker than the home. The home could be three years, the ADU could be three months or 60 days or, or you know, two rounds of 60 days. Um, so the way it works is your design team um, which could be a designer typically because uh, of the cost of these versus an architect, but you know, you can obviously use an architect. If it's a ground up construction or a conversion of garages, you'll need a structural engineer um, because you need to make sure that is up to code today. And then also an energy consultant that does our title 24 sheets that just is like an algorithm that says facing this way in the sun, we have this much windows. This is our HVAC. Um, this is what we're using for a water heater. Does it hit California stringent energy codes so that we are working on, on trying to build stuff that is, is energy conservative as possible? Um, typically it can take uh, one to three months for that design phase. And then that permitting time, we say four to six months because you've got to give yourself a time for at least a second round of corrections, maybe a third. Cause like I said, doing this as many times I have, I've still never once been able to get the perfect plan the very first time. Um, so give yourself four to six months. Um, the construction phase, six to 12 months, but also sometimes, you know, depending on what it is, it can be four months. So the permitting can take as long as the construction takes, which is very interesting, um, but, you know, six to 12 months. So it's very possible to be all in within a year and then give yourself a month in order to find a good tenant for, for what you're looking for. Um, permitting fees, five to 10, your design fees. So you, you pay your designer. And then when you submit to the city, you get your first round of fees to do the plan review. Then when your plans are approved, you have your second round of fees to pull your building permit. And then you have your construction costs to pay for the actual development of it. Um, down here is your, your team members. You're going to have Whoever's going to say, I think you should do a detached ADU here or an attached ADU or the junior ADU. And that's going to be your design team. And that design designer should have an engineer and a permitting um, consultant that they work with. And then uh, depending on if you already have a general contractor, after that first round, that's when I would feel safe of showing those plans to a general contractor because you know pretty much what changes might need to be made after that first round of corrections so that a general contractor isn't necessarily putting together a bid for something that might completely change. After that first round, you have a very good foundation of what's gonna be there. Um, and, and for financing, you're gonna want to have a, a plan set that's pretty close to being approved and as much detailed in, from a general contractor as possible um, so that when that bank asks what it is you're building, you have a plan in place for what the construction number is gonna be, who's gonna do it, their experience. So as you get closer to getting your plans approved, please talk to whoever your general contractor is gonna be. Um, there are also uh, local government programs. Um, I am a, a program manager for the city of Pasadena and the city of West Hollywood ADU program, where if in these cities, they will give you uh, up to $200,000 um, to build an ADU in your backyard, 1% uh, simple interest, um, and you get a design team such as myself to come in and teach you how to be a backyard developer um, to go through this whole entire process. Now, the local government programs do have uh, a restriction or requirement, more say, that you rent them out to a low income tenant. And that's the whole idea of this. We will help give you, I mean, 1% interest money is extremely good today. And uh, we only ask that the tenant that you rent to is someone that is um, 
usually through the housing authority that already checks for you that the tenant that you're renting to is a low income tenant, whether that is a section eight voucher holder or someone that the housing authority has vetted as a low income tenant. Um, there's also grant programs like the city of Claremont will give you a grant uh, to reimburse some of those costs. There's also uh, the city of LA's rental subsidy program um, and then tenant assistance in order to help you get a tenant in. Um, and then what's very much talked about in the ADU world is uh, the Cal HFA state ADU grant, which is a $40,000 grant that pays for your design costs, your permit fees, your pre-construction, and that's a grant. It doesn't need to be paid back. Um, it is income-based. So uh, if you're making a half million a year, it's probably not gonna qualify you, but it's based on your the, the income restrictions through the county. And you can check that at the, the Cal HFA site. Um, but uh, you, you typically have to work with a nonprofit or a lender in order to get it on their website. It shows you who, you, but when you have your, your whole set of bids and, and to be reimbursed, they will give you this 40 grand back. Um, it did run out of funds, um, but the, the state did release another 50 million in funds. So there is still another opening in order for people to apply this. We're hoping that because it's been such a successful program that we can get uh, more funds dedicated to this but time will tell. Um, now let's talk about sustainability. Um, you know, ADUs are typically naturally occurring affordable housing just because they're typically smaller. Um, many of the ADUs I build are a size that isn't even, even on the rental radar, right? So there's not much 380 square foot ADUs that are, or, or even rental units that are available in the city of Pasadena. Um, as far as sustainability goes, every ADU must go through the Title 24 energy requirements that say that it conforms to the state mandates, which is very high compared to what other states have. Um, all new construction ADUs need to have solar panels now um, or be solar ready. Um, we also have low impact development standards so that rainwater um, gets captured. Like in the city of LA, uh, one of the paths to satisfy this is that the rainwater flows into a rain barrel and that rain barrel collects the water, which can be used for the landscaping that's also required around it. So uh, reducing the carbon footprint um, for new construction and then the ability that you can convert space that's already there, you're already taking existing space, you're already taking existing materials, especially with a junior ADU, you're taking a bedroom that already exists and creating a new housing unit out of it, which is, you know, it wasn't anything that existed before. So you're not taking something down to build something new, you're taking what's existing and building upon it, reducing your carbon footprint. Um, best practices, um, as uh, many cities in California have received a grant from uh, the Southern California Association of Governments on pre-approved plans, uh, those will start to pop up. Um, City of LA has a massive marketplace of different pre-approved plans. They even have one free one that you can take and you can get it to work for your property um, and reduce the time frame and the cost because you don't have to hire that design team. You just need to implement it to yours. Um, the, the state law that just passed. So let's just say I submitted an ADU in Pasadena and it gets approved. That same plan should be allowed to be used into any other property in the city of Pasadena or say you approved it in the city of LA that would fit on that lot. So if it was a detached 400 square foot unit and it fits in another parcel, it's deemed pre-approved. So your neighbor could use the same plan potentially. Um, it's brand new, it'll start January 1st. So we'll see how it works, but a marketplace is gonna be created so that someone can look and see these plans that have been approved and see if that works for you. Um, the city of San Diego has a bonus ADU program for every additional ADU uh, that you deem affordable, you can build another market rate one for it. So it's, you know, one affordable, one market rate, one for one. And you can do that almost infinitely uh, as long as it hits the development standards there. Um, another big thing that has really changed is the procedural uh, online development streamlining so that all departments receive an application at one time instead of needing to submit to planning, submitting to fire and having to try to figure out even if some of these departments you don't even know exist until you're at the end, you think you're ready to build, but you didn't talk to uh, construction and demolition for your recycling plan. 
now streamlining to where you submit it in one place and it goes to everyone to review within that 60 day period has been a game changer. Um, and, and a lot of guidance and clarity from local governments on as these rules change every year, what, what it means to us as homeowners, owners, developers to build ADUs. I mean, the city of LA does an amazing job on putting out these memos saying, oh, this new law state, state law passed, what does that mean to our city? And I think the best thing of that is that means that they're actually reading it. I am working in, let's say 60 cities and I would say 75% of them have no idea what I'm talking about. And I have to quote them the state law and fight with them to say, you know, this is what we have to do. And it's not really optional. It's a state law, you have to do this. So the best practices for local governments are to review these state laws every year and just put a memo to everyone. So they're all on the same page, all of our planners, all of our building safety on the same page, instead of just having one person and then it goes to someone else and they have to all be trained on each project by project, a memo across the board. Um, our, the housing community development puts out their fact sheets and their guidebooks. So we have the updated 2022 ADU handbook, which is like the Bible of all of the ADU um, rules. It's like almost a hundred page document. So that's a great place to start for anyone that's looking to know more. Um, the, the, more on the ADU standardized plans, 75 pre-approved plans that have already been reviewed for code compliance. And one of those that's our free uh, pre-approved plan. Now you'd have to put it into your, your parcel. You'd have to, you know, but that even could potentially be a hand drawing that says, here's my house and 25 feet from the house and four foot setbacks, this is where we're going to put it. Um, so it's a, it's a great way to, to keep costs down. Um, this is a study from SCAG on, which is our Southern California Association of Governments on the actual affordability of ADUs. Now there's a, a talking point that ADUs are just built in someone's backyard for their office or just to raise up property values. And we actually don't find that to be true. It's, it's an untrue talking point that people try to use against this housing typology, but it is typically not true. 15% um, of ADUs in the LA region for extremely low income up to 43%, you know, which is a massive number for low income and 34% for 120% uh, uh, or above AMI income. Um, so these, these numbers are actual statistics that show that ADUs are affordable, even if they are not required uh, to be deed restricted, which most of these are not. I mean, I would say almost every one of these that are probably data points are not deed restricted or income restricted in any way, but they still do get rented out to this way. Um, most of the locations in LA, you'll see that it's distributed everywhere. ADUs are not necessarily just in the high income area or in the low income area. We see that ADUs are distributed throughout LA city. And I find the same in almost every local government I work in that it, it, they cross and transcend to uh, all regions of the city, not just the, the high end or the low end everywhere. 20% um, are new construction where you have a majority of conversions, which because you already have a space in there, it makes a lot of sense why that ends up to be that number. Um, and here's our, our resources links. Uh, like I talked about, I think this slide deck will be distributed to everyone. And these links right here are some of the, the tools that'll really help uh, someone that wants to know more or a beginning practitioner, or even, you know, some of this stuff is brand new to me. Like, uh, is a brand new ADU subject to rent control, um, which is you know really interesting because some of the cities start to implement rent control. What we found, and we're still not 100% clear, but new construction is still under the or new construction detached ADUs are still under rent stabilization ordinance, so like just cause evictions, but they are not under rent control because they're new construction under Costa Hawkins. Now, if it's a conversion of something that was built before uh, the standards in Cos Hawkins, it's, we're, we're still not really sure if it would fall under the rent control portion. We believe it is. I think that's what we determined it is. But uh, LAHD put out a FAQ. Um, and here's some of these links. Um, you know, I just ran into How To Aid You, uh, Ryan O'Connell in San Francisco over the weekend. Great guy. And it just got a lot of information on his page. And Symbian Build is a, uh, 
a company web base where you can put something in your backyard and see if it fits. And a lot of cities are actually implementing Symbian into their own city websites um, in order to help local homeowners see if it fits for them. Um, now to our Q&A portion. Uh, if there's anyone on here that has any questions, I know there's a bunch in the chat. Um, I don't know, should we read those or does anyone wanna jump in and ask a question? Yeah, y'all are free to uh, unmute yourselves if you'd like to, to voice your question. Otherwise, uh, we can read them off the chat. Jay? G oh, yes, oh, hi. Oh. Sorry, let's do Jay and then we'll get to you, Lauren, because your hand's up right after, okay? Hey, Jay. Hi, hi Andrew, how are you? Very good. Awesome. Uh, thanks for connecting over uh, Instagram and all other social platforms. So I've been looking at, at a couple of properties in Los Angeles. I think it's it's not specific uh, uh, to one property. Uh, I, I, I heard about splitting a property like a friend. Let's say if you have a four bed, three bed, I can convert, split it to two twos and two one, right? What, what is it called? Is that a Jadu? What is that? Is that Jadu? Jadu, and is it applicable for every port in Los Angeles? So um, uh, I'll jump on that, Matt, if there's anything else you want to add to it. Uh, the junior AD would be one of the, the routes that you can take. But in city of LA, you also can do up to one conversion of existing space into an attached ADU as well. Um, so there's two different routes that you can take there. You can do an attached conversion or a junior ADU, depending on the size of it. So if it's over 500 square feet and you're okay with the owner occupancy covenant, that might be the way to go. If it is uh, more than that, you might wanna do the attached conversion, but that attached conversion um, in city of LA is allowed for living space, but not everywhere. Other municipalities may not allow that because typically the conversion is for non-livable space. So be very careful. It, it goes jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So it needs to be owner occupied until how many years? Two years or in, in, indefinite? I don't know. I think it's three years. Okay. I believe it's three years, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Sounds good. Yeah, uh, never just for the junior ADU. It doesn't exist yeah. for the other. Yeah. What, what was the number, Matt? Oh, no, sorry. I was just I was saying that requirement for owner occupancy is only for the junior ADU. It does not yeah. apply to the other types of ADUs. But I thought it was I thought it was like as long as you have the JADU, you have to live there, that it wasn't. I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Lauren, what do you got? Lauren? Unmuting. There we go. There you go. <laughs> um, I've got two questions. So I'm going to ask one and then let Giovanni go. And then if you have time, you can come back to me for the second one. Okay. Sure. All right. So question one. What systems are in place, or are there any, to prevent ADUs from becoming yet another front for housing discrimination? Um, discrimination how? Renting. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I know how to answer that. Um, you know, because the owner of the property still has their own owner's rights, they typically can either check pick who they want to rent to or not rent to them at all. Um, so I, I would say that all fair housing rental laws apply as they would with any other unit. Um, you know, you can't, you, you can't um, pick someone based on race, color, uh, ethnicity, the same thing for fair housing. And I think that's federally implemented. So some of the same standards apply to ADUs that they would for any rental unit across the board which means nothing will happen because it's gross enforcement is grossly underfunded to the point that it's laughable. But we are pushing as a policy, let's get all of these ADUs to alleviate the homelessness of poor people. And it's starting to see, I mean, you gave some interesting statistics, but I kind of wanted to know what those people look like because minorities are disproportionately um, the most impacted by these issues. And the second one is women with small children and ADUs don't really alleviate the problems that they have finding housing. And section eight, nobody enforces that discrimination. So 
I think this is a question we all need to be asking and demanding answers to. You know, I can only speak on the units I own, but most of all my tenants are low income tenants, either students, um, all races, all nationalities. Um, and really it's housing that they could not afford and they're very thankful. I never hear from any of my tenants because they couldn't find a place anywhere. And I'm like, please, are you, is everything okay? Do you need anything? Because it is affordable and places that they wouldn't be able to get a chance to live to because there was nowhere else. Most of my tenants either lived in a hotel or on the street before they had the option. So yes, I can't speak for everyone, but just about everyone I work with says about the same thing. And it's not because I'm working with just good guys. I'm working with guys that this is their business to make money and it's almost the same story. So yeah, while it may not be built in and I don't know exactly how that would work out, I would say that a majority of these units are available to people that wouldn't have this type of housing before. And I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, I might just, I mean, I, I think it's a fair point that ADUs are not like the only, like they're not, they're not, they're not just, they don't solve every housing issue, right? They, and they like, they don't, they're not great for like large family. They're not, they're small. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't hit all the marks about all the things we need our housing to do. Um, we certainly need, larger units, family size units, um, more housing subsidies, more, more, you know, dedicated, we need all, we need all at all, but this, it, it does fill a nation. And yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's fair to say our, our enforcement of fair housing is not what it needs to be. That's, that's not just an ADU problem. That is, that is an issue across the board, but I, it's important. Like, I think what, it, like the positive spin is like, these are neighborhoods that didn't allow renters for like 60 years, right? Like that, that was a form, that was a racial you know, base form of sort of discrimination against renters in most of our single family neighborhoods um, that ADUs directly uh, attacks that and allows, you know, renters, which again, you know, are typically lower income, uh, which means they're more likely to be, uh, you know, people of color and other, other folks that are normally discriminated against the housing market who wouldn't have a chance in that neighborhood without the ADU, but uh, certainly not, uh, not, not unfair to, to criticize and acknowledge that ADUs can't can't do it all and 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 uh and discrimination does exist so I, yeah i just want to acknowledge that yeah. great question geo can we do uh one more question i don't i don't want to keep folks way too past the time so if you can just hit us with your question real quick hey guys uh apologies if i missed it i jumped in a little later but i'm curious uh you know having an adu is pretty important for a duplex for you know people to be able to afford homes in LA now, at what point would a feasibility consultant like be good to to hire or or get involved in your process as you're looking at like homes or properties to purchase? Is it just in the investigating phase or how does that work really? You know, it's it can it, it really can be based on the property itself, but the biggest rules are you know, is there four feet on the side and four feet in the rear and then some building separation. I typically say six feet from say the existing building and just you, you picture a box of that open space and that's where your detached ADU can be. You don't need a, a, a consultant to do four feet and six feet away. And then you have an idea of what that box looks like. Um, as far as uh, conversions, like if you have a garage, that's a conversion. Um, if you want to go the junior AD route, is there a, a bedroom that has the ability to share a bathroom? So in that point, you know, you can do a lot of it yourself, especially if you do something like read the ADU handbook, you can see these little rules, but that's, that's the major thing. I think your design team should have the next step on your feasibility. So if you hire a designer to do the plans, it should be someone that has done ADU before and gotten them approved. A big thing, you know, someone that's uh, submitted plants that never gotten approved uh, isn't very helpful. And I see that a lot where someone comes to me because their person got it in over their head because they didn't realize that it needed structural engineering plans and all these Title 24 things that it isn't just, you know, you draw a floor plan. Um, but that person will be the person who then goes in and does the feasibility. And they should have some idea about construction as well. Like, will you need an electrical panel upgrade? where the sewer connection line may run. And if that's gonna be an extreme cost because it has to run 150 feet to the front of the street and someone has to trench all that. So as someone that has some idea of the construction, you don't necessarily have to have a general contractor show up, although it would help 
but I would say a designer that has an idea of the background. But when you get these approved and you go through the corrections, you learn a lot about it yourself too. So, you know, most of the, the stuff I've learned have come from having hundreds of corrections saying, this is what it's supposed to look like. So you learn through that path as well. So being hands-on instead of just giving it to someone, if you have the time to follow up on the corrections and what gets done also will help you learn about housing. And, and it does translate to say 150 unit building. You know, the skills I've learned from my ADUs do translate to my larger multifamily development. It's just on a bigger scale, but it does translate across the board. So I recommend, you know, hiring a designer or your design team that has gotten ADUs approved and being as hands-on as your time allows you. Got it, I appreciate it. I'll just, go ahead. Sorry, I was just, I was just gonna add quickly uh, to Andrew's great advice there that, the, and I think we're gonna share the deck um, with these links and the resources, that last page, that's Symbium. I've been, I've been giving a lot of people that reach out to me saying, hey, I just wanna know if I could build an ADU on my property. I've been sending them to that Symbium. Um, it's a great web tool uh, developed in the Bay Area. It has every property and has a little ADU tool and is very, very good at sort of that quick and dirty answers. Can I fit an ADU and how big could it be given you know, the placement of where it has to be and it, it has the rules embedded in it and you can start to draw it out and see it. And then there's an ADU calculator that like is really good at like calculating estimated costs and how much rent could you make that like economic feasibility, right? Does it make sense for me economically? How much is it gonna cost for what I'm gonna get? So those two tools, I'll just give a shout out um, short of hiring people, which is probably the right answer, Andrew. Um, you might be able to do just some of those with those web-based tools that we'll be sharing out. No, that's that's really great. And, and these days, the feasibility studies that I end up having to take on now are are much larger conversions, like hundred unit buildings into the twenty five. Because you, but the rest of it now, there's enough tools out there that you don't need an Andrew or someone else like me to show up to do it because those tools are out there that make it very quick to get a rough idea of what you can and you can plan from there. Awesome. So my second question. Yeah, I was just going to check in with you all to make sure you're okay if, in case you have to go. Like, I'm, are you okay for a I'm okay for a few more questions. Okay, perfect. Go ahead, Lauren. Okay, so um, uh, taking into account that ADUs are formerly known as granny flats and that the two biggest groups um, on fixed incomes having difficulty affording housing are seniors and the disabled are there any adu requirements in uh, no, adu ada requirements in building adus uh no not from the standpoint of most single family homes do not have to adhere to, to ada um but with that said all of the adu projects i have where it is for uh, a, a mother-in-law or a grandmother or the granny suite it's thought of in the beginning with shower handrails, wider bathrooms. So it's thought of in the design of it where you're, you're going to ask, who is this for? And then you design for who it's for, um, but uh, it's, it's not required. Four units or more is when ADA kicks in, is that right? Yeah, yeah. correct, yeah. But they are, you know, they're, they're ground level, right? Which gives them a leg up. You're not, you don't have to worry about accessing usually. So it's not second story. There's usually not stairs. So they're more naturally accessible, but again, fair, fair question. Um, yeah, but, doorways, yeah. if you have a wheelchair, yeah. Um, it, it, things, yeah, I think about these things because everybody deserves a home. Yes, yeah. And the ability to be in the backyard with family. Right, that is a major thing to where you can be, you know, with your family instead of at some extremely high-priced uh, adult care center that I don't even know how anyone affords them these days because the pricing we think fair or housing is out of control for us. If we look at what it costs for our our aging uh, population, it's insane. Second mortgages. Yeah. Second mortgages, mortgages. Yeah. Uh, those are great questions. Um, I think we may just have one more, unless Geo. I think you didn't you didn't lower your hand, uh, but uh, if you, if you have any other questions, let us know. But Jay, what do you got? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me back. So, quick question. So, I know there is a uh, uh, you know uh, a rule that you can convert the garages to an ADU. Usually, the garages that I see ha doesn't have any easements. It's attached to all the you know all the four boundaries or maybe the neighboring neighboring properties. 
does that properties value to convert to an ADU or how do I fix it? Uh, I guess I didn't understand the correct the question. Is it okay to convert to an, to an ADU? Yeah, if it, if it doesn't have, set, if it's built right on the property line. Got it. it which is, yeah. Yeah, very good. So, so conversion of anything that was, at one point, it had to be a legalized structure. So if it was a legal garage that was built with zero setbacks, it was fine to be converted as long as you could provide the records. As of this year, that no longer matters. As long as it's an existing structure, it can be converted to an accessory dwelling unit, um, whether or not it's not conforming zoning or it's an unpermitted structure. That structure will be able to be converted and as long as it hits all health and safety standards. So if it's going to somehow put someone at risk, uh, the local building official can deny it if they can have substantial evidence in writing on why we can't implement this as an ADU. But otherwise you should be able to convert just about any structure to an accessory dwelling unit as long as it has its primary structure. Yeah, and, and there's a nice little bonus too that they added a couple of years ago that says, say the garage is like falling over and like it, it just, you want it, it just doesn't, you know, you need, you need to rebuild the garage, right? It's, it's not suitable. It's going to be, you know, too, too much craziness to try to make it up to code. It needs to come down. They actually allow you to rebuild in the same footprint um, in that case and retain those rights of not needing the setback again, subject to the health and safety that Andrew talked about. And then you can even actually expand it a little bit. You could do you, you, the resisting footprint plus 150 square feet for ingress egress, which is a little mysterious what that means. But like, you, you know, if it's needed for a porch or an entryway or window, I, got, I don't know. Who knows? It's a little unclear what that means. But basically, you could rebuild the structure with a little bit of addition um, if you say it's for ingress egress. And so and not have to do the four foot setback and retain those rights um, again without if, as long as there's not health and safety. So. That's, yeah, that's really important. We say that a lot, right? There's a lot of garages yeah. that are right on the property line. Those were unusable until, again, the state law came in and, and made that rule. Yep. So, Jay, yeah, they're convertible now. Pretty much anywhere, you know, it's the feasibility is yes, you can. Yep. And, and oh, can you talk about a little bit about what are the, what are the reasons the building, man, uh, you know, the safety and development would cancel it? Is it close to like electric pole kind of thing? What is that for you? Yeah, I think I think that is part of it. You know, there is standards to not be uh, with. I think it's within five feet of underneath an electrical line um, is, is one of the standards I've seen. Um, some of the things are implementing fire sprinklers, which is you know it kind of becomes a, somewhat of an argument because it says if the primary doesn't need fire sprinklers, but they could say because of where it is, it requires fire sprinklers. So that's something I've seen come up that has been a very hard argument to go against. Um, but, you know, that's that's a question that I have not seen because it's such a high barrier. You need to implement uh, very substantial evidence on why this isn't going to fit. And typically there's not. It's really, you know, if anyone wanted to deny it, it's just to deny housing. And that's not a justifiable reason to not provide housing. So, you know, that electrical is big. But other than that. I really, you know, maybe an earthquake fault line, but that that kind of precludes all housing typologies, not just specific to ADUs. Got it. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna call it here, Matt, Andrew. Thank you guys so much. This is like so much crucial information, uh, and I think that uh, we really, really got into some of the nitty gritty on stuff, especially. Uh, particularly when talking about like affordability and stuff like that, that's obviously important with Abundant Housing LA's uh, mission and uh, and all of our pro housing course students, like that's the lens that we teach it through. So thank you so much for all of this information. It, it's been fantastic. And all of you who are enrolled, I will get uh, all the content uploaded this week. Um, and if you're not enrolled in this course yet, I did invite a couple of the folks from the 12 week course, uh, I will share the slide deck with you and uh, reach out to me about getting enrolled in this course. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask that anyone else that's watching this today or later, talk to your local government and ask them what programs they have for affordable ADUs, uh, because very few uh, cities are going above the state law, but there is a lot of stuff out there, whether it's a loan program, a density program, um, lowering fees, for affordable units, give some incentive for people to do 
lower income ADUs because this is such an important typology, but it needs to go a little bit above and beyond. So ask your local government, what are you doing or can you do something to have them start thinking about it? And, and a big shout out to Matt. Thank you so much for the help for the slide deck and all your time putting this together. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.